So what did you do this week? I was at CYF camp uh, with our high schoolers down in Athens, Texas. We left right after worship service uh, this, uh, this service last week on Sunday um, and got just south of Fayetteville before the minibus broke down. Um, and so there I was on the side of the road with uh, all of the kids. And uh, so we got out and uh, got out of the van since it was kind of tipping over every time a, a big truck went by. <laughs> we decided it was safer on, in the grass. And we had lots of fun seeing if we could get the uh, um, trucks to honk and, and all of that. And then uh, finally, a, um, a highway patrolman pulled up and, and he offered to uh, help shuttle kids so we could get them up the road a little bit to a gas station while we waited for a wrecker and for Daryl Button to come and bring us another van and trailer so we could head on our way. So if you see any pictures of some of our youth in the back of a police car, they, <laughs> they have uh, permission and it was not what it looks like. Uh, <clears throat> so Pastor Sean is on vacation, taking a week of vacation with his family and um, they're camping and they just uh, got a a new little pop-up camper and, and so they're spending some time down in Texas this week and if you looked on Facebook this morning you'll see that uh, last night didn't go so well their first night in the little pop-up camper with those storms that came through here uh, went through there uh, in the middle of the night and uh, so Michelle says that they have a pop-up camper for sale cheap when they get home <laughs> if you if you're looking for one of those so Keep them in your prayers as they uh, have some time together as a family and, and that the weather cooperates for the rest of their trip. Um, would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for this time, for this place. We ask that you would open our eyes, our ears, our spirits to hear what you have to teach us today. That you would remind us that we are enough and that you and your grace are enough for us. So God, help us to trust more and help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So I've chosen several scriptures for us to look at. If you want to grab a Bible and, and uh, look, look along with us, or they'll be up on the screen. We're going to start in Psalms. Psalm 46 uh, is uh, the first verse we'll look at. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow and shatters the spear. He, he burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And in Philippians chapter 4, Verses 19 and 20, it says this, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So I titled my sermon, Enough is Enough. And I'm wondering for you just how much is enough. There's a story of two old friends who bumped into each other one day out on the street and one of them looked really forlorn, really down in the dumps, almost on the verge of tears. And so his friend asked, what has the world done to you that, that you look so sad today? So the sad fellow said, well, let me tell you, 
about three weeks ago, uh, my uncle passed away and, and he left me $40,000. His friend said, wow, that's a lot of money. He said, I know, but two weeks ago, a cousin of mine that I'd never even met died and left me $85,000 free and clear. He said, well, it sounds like you've really been blessed. He says, you don't understand. Last week, my great aunt passed away and I inherited almost a quarter of a million dollars. Now his friend was really confused and looked at him and said, then why? Why do you look so glum? Why are you so sad? And his friend said, this week, nothing. <laughs> How much is enough? As I was driving to camp and, and visiting with Sean and talking about what I uh, wanted to preach with you all today, and I told him I, I just wanted to preach about enough. And, uh, and I think, you know, all these spiritual disciplines we've been looking at in this Opening to God series uh, lead us to a place where we are able to trust God more fully. Pastor Verzola Law was our keynoter at the camp that I was at with our high school students. And um, I'm, I didn't know what she was going to talk about. She didn't know what I was thinking about. We've been friends for a long time. She got up and her very first keynote was entitled, You Are Enough. And so I have to admit that I stole some of her keynotes for my sermon this morning. And I want to give her credit uh, there. But... Uh, but it seems to me that God wants us to hear that there is enough, a message about enough. And so um, one of my favorite stories when I think about God being enough, God being sufficient for us is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. And so in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, we read this story. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, uh, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to Jesus and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them to me. Jesus said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, broke the loaves, and then gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and they all were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men plus the women and children. This is one of the stories, one of the miracles of Jesus that appears in all four of the Gospels. This story was so important to each of the Gospel writers that every one of them wanted to make sure it was recorded and passed along. This is one of my favorite stories because it teaches about God's uh, abundance. Even when there seems to be no way, when there seems to not be nearly enough, that God can step in and make more than enough. Enough that in this story, everyone was filled, everyone was satisfied, and there were still 12 baskets of leftovers. That's God's abundance in the midst of our need. Now there's times in our lives when we realize that we are not enough, that we don't have enough, that we can't meet the need. It's those times, I believe, when we're forced to rely on our faith, to trust in God's abundance. Those times when the storms come rolling through our lives, like they did our community this morning, that we trust God the most. Matthew 23 through 27, uh, it says that then Jesus got into the boat and the disciples followed and suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake 
so that they, the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. So the disciples went and they woke him up and said, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, Oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? Suddenly, a furious storm showed up on the lake. Our youth went down to Houston a couple of weeks ago to work on the homes of, of some people who were flooded during Hurricane Harvey last summer. Those people saw this huge storm, <clears throat> a huge storm that was headed their way. And I can only assume that as those waters rose that the people in the Houston area also cried out, Lord, save us. As they watched their possessions flood and float away, wondering if Jesus was sleeping, one of the ladies we worked with kept saying to us how blessed she was. This same lady who had less than a year ago lost almost everything she had in the storm. So here in this story, we find the disciples in the midst of a storm, and Jesus is asleep. He's in the stern, asleep on a cushion, and so they wake him up and they say, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? It looks like they're accusing Jesus of not caring about them. Now, I'm, I'm sure that none of us have ever done that or ever felt that. Like Jesus was asleep and not even noticing the storms that are destroying our lives. That our, our souls are troubled when we face these situations that we just don't know. We're, just, we're not quite sure that Jesus can handle it. We fear that because uh, we're, we really don't know if Jesus is strong enough or powerful enough to handle this issue. It's almost like the disciples had no confidence in Jesus when it came to him helping them. I mean, they had seen him uh, heal people. They had seen him do all of these miracles. But when it came to them and their life, in the middle of their storm, they weren't so sure. And so they go down and they wake him up. And he says, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And they asked themselves, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? There's no storm that Jesus can't calm. I can, I can just see Jesus waking up. And I'm sure he was exhausted from all the work he had been doing. And, and you can just see when, when the disciples run down there and, and he's asleep. He's asleep because he knows that the Father's in control. He's not worried about this. But I, I wonder what he's thinking when, when these men wake him up who are scared to death. Scared that they are about to die. I believe that there had to be at least a little bit of frustration on Jesus' part. That after all they had seen, all the miracles they had witnessed, and yet that knowledge and that power that they were so aware of didn't seem to apply to their storm. Jesus' power that calmed this storm can also help us, can help us deal with the problems we face. Jesus is willing to help us if we only ask. But far too often, we discount that power. We feel like maybe Jesus can do something for someone else, but, but not for my problems. It's too much, even for Jesus. And Jesus gets up, and, and maybe he's being a little hard on them. After all, they, they thought they were going to die. But he says, why do you have so little faith? He rebukes them because they thought, they believed with all their heart 
that this storm they were facing was bigger than their Lord. They believed that Jesus wasn't really enough. So the simple truth I think we learn from this story is that there's not a storm too large for Jesus to call. Notice right after Jesus uh, questions them or rebukes them for doubting, he calms the wind and the waves. And what looked impossible became possible with Jesus, even for them. I have a life application Bible that I, I like to look at when I'm studying because it often asks important questions or, or gives little insights to this. And, and in this passage, it gives us some insights to the wind and the waves. It says, sometimes no one but Jesus can do anything about the storm. It says, when we reach the end of our resources, what we can do Jesus hasn't even started. It says hopeless situations give us the clearest opportunities to trust God. And so when it comes to the storm, storms in our lives, storms in the scripture, Pastor Law at CYF conference reminded us that the best thing we can do is to make sure we have Jesus in the boat with us. Because those storms will come. And we will need Jesus to calm them. Through this whole series of opening to God, we've been trying different spiritual disciplines, different exercises to help us grow closer to God and understand God more fully. And so today I invite you to join in another exercise. We've practiced prayer and meditation and scripture memorization and journaling and so many other things. Today I want us to practice simply reciting a promise of God as a way to find peace even in the midst of the storms of your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 says, or God says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. And so I invite you today to, to think about some situations in your life. And then I'm going to ask you to repeat after me or, or repeat with me after that the promise of God by saying God's grace is enough. God's grace is enough because too often we don't dwell in these promises of God. Even if we know them, even if they're part of, of our understanding of God, too far too often we forget those promises when it comes to the storms in our lives. So if God's grace is truly enough, then it's enough. Enough is enough. We don't need to do anything else. We don't have to try any harder. We don't have to do anything more because in our weakness, God's grace is enough. Our only need is to trust, to put our faith in Jesus who can speak peace and calm into the storms even in our lives. So I want you to get comfortable. If you want to close your eyes, it's been just a moment thinking about that thing, that, that situation, that thing that you did that you just can't seem to forgive yourself for. And I invite you to say to that situation, God's grace is enough. Think about that person in your life that you find most difficult to love. And I invite you to say to that person, God's grace is enough. Think about that thing that brings the most anxiety to you right now. And I invite you to say to that thing, God's grace 
is enough. If you feel like you are about to drown, that the waves are crashing around you, I invite you to say and to know that God's grace is enough. Amen.